Um, thank you very much to Nehem and to Arts Catalyst for the invitation to speak to you this evening. And it's uh, great to speak after Antemann in that very interesting discussion. Um, I'm going to talk about two different projects tonight. Um, the first is uh, the first project I did, um, the first commission project I did, which was commissioned by Arts Catalyst in 1998. And it was shot in Russia as doc photographs, a photographic series called Legacy Systems. Um, and I decided to go to Russia to photograph space technology that had fallen back to Earth. So the kind of Russian space icons and look at the way that they were memorialized. So this is um, a re replica of uh, Sputnik. And I'm going to just read you my artist statement, uh, very short. The space race represents an extreme point in the achievements of the 20th century, not least as a zenith of faith in scientific progress. The Legacy Systems series traces this vision to the heart of contemporary Russia. These technological crown jewels are portrayed as they lie stranded in the present, like the scatterings of an unruly time capsule. Removed from the familiar iconography of science fiction or Cold War paranoia, these little seen giants of the 20th century imagination appear small and vulnerable, like the shock of celebrity glimpsed in the flesh. So, these were photographed in museums and um, Star City as well. Here's an image from Star City. I was the first uh, Western artist to go to Star City. Fantastic. You know, this is um, a space university in Moscow. And I just love this. You know, they use kind of school desks. Um, I just made visually so amazing to kind of, you know, the, what you're seeing in the top of the image there is the underside of a rocket. So they actually teach underneath rockets. I mean, it's so vibrant, so kind of dynamic, and yet really dated in a kind of very compelling way. And I guess this image um, was a way for me to think through my growing interest in kind of corporate power and corporate influence. This is a logo for a, a Russian space um, company. Very, um, as you can see, it's kind of being chipped away. So it's kind of slightly degraded. And this is um, an image called Half Light. It's the top, very top section of a rocket at the last moment of sun in the day, you know, that beautiful glowing pinky orange light you get just before the sun goes down. And then this image um, is called the desk. And again, it's shot in the Space University. And fantastic, you know, this <laughs> the idea of being taught uh, or studying maybe alone, facing into a rocket engine. And um, this image uh, I actually showed recently um, as part of the next um, project I'm going to show you, which is the kind of heart of my talk today. So what I'm going to talk to you about is um, an exhibition that I did at Paula Cooper Gallery in New York called Contracting Universe. And the theme of the show was to take a kind of broad look at space law, so legal agreements that relate to outer space, and to take, you know, in a broad sense, the idea of the ridiculousness that humans would try and think that law could extend out into space. And yet, this is a growing field. It's uh, particularly being spurred on by a uh, commercial interest in privatizing space, and taking space out of what's been a, a kind of common agreement since the Second World War, that any discoveries made in space should be for the benefit of mankind. And there's an increasing interest, as those values are eroded on land, on the Earth, those values are also um, being eroded in space. So there's now incredible interest in mining rights and general um, kind of commercial um, interest, and you can imagine the commercial potential once you start um, thinking in that way. 
So the works in the show um, were included photography, text, sculpture, and installation. And they also take a look at the idea of the human interest in managing the infinite. So these are general installation views, and I'm going to talk about the specific works in the show. So this is the first piece. Uh, this is called Report of the Legal Subcommittee. And what you see here is, um, on the top half is a kind of map of the stars. It's a different constellations. And the lower half is a transcript of a conversation that took place at the United Nations. And they have um, what's called a legal subcommittee. And the legal subcommittee um, discusses the peaceful uses of outer space. And like all UN conversations, they're documented and transcribed and placed into the public domain. And what's fantastic about this conversation, which I'm going to give you, is the star map. And there's the conversation. And what's fantastic about this conversation is that the delegations realize that they've been meeting for 40 years, same place, same time, and they've been trying to come up with a legal definition of outer space. And they've been discussing this same topic for 40 years. And what they realize through the course of this conversation is that they, they haven't been able to do it. And then the different delegations start proposing reasons why they've completely failed to define what outer space is. And so there are fantastic um, reasons, including the complaint that scientists have managed to define it, and, and you know why is it that law cannot understand or come up with a kind of rationale, um, and maybe we should just stick to the scientific definition. So it's a great, I think, very very kind of human um, realization of one's kind of failure in the face of the infinite and also the sublime, and. Um, in that sense, I think there's a kind of poetry there. Now this piece is called Missing Mass, and it was actually made with the assistance of Dr. Malcolm Fairburn, who's in the audience, and we just heard him speaking a moment ago. He's the um, voice of physics um, at the back. And uh, Dr. Fairburn was a wonderful um, advisor on my project. Um, he's an expert in um, um, cosmology and astrophysics uh, from King's College. And this piece uses a legal disclaimer and dark matter particles. So um, what you see here is a plinth with some text screen printed onto it and then a container, a, a kind of perspex cube container on the top. And here's a... Um, in case you can't read this, I'll read it out. So the, it, the contents are 5,461 dark matter particles present in a perspex container, 18 by 18 by 18 inches. And there's an asterisk. And then the asterisk points below to a disclaimer. Uh, dark matter particles are governed by their own laws and may circulate freely. The figure of 5,461 dark matter particles represents an average according to current scientific thinking. Actual amounts may, may vary from time to time. Dark matter is transparent and undetectable to the human eye. Since dark matter may at any time pass through any surrounding man-made or natural structures, including the walls of this container, your body, and the whole material structure of the planet, any collector of this work should not expect to own the same 5,461 dark matter particles at any one time. So this is really a piece, um, it's kind of actually about freedom, you know, it purports to be about dark matter particles, but at the same time it's really about freedom because you realise that dark matter particles are perhaps the only truly free thing on earth. Human beings certainly are constrained by their gravity, by their makeup, and dark matter particles can pass through absolutely anything that we, um, that we, we think about on this planet. So it's also um, a comment on the art market. You know, this is one of those pieces that's very much about the belief of the collector. It asks for a certain faith in the collector 
that there are even dark matter particles present, or um, in the kind of scientific basis of the project, you know, there has to be a belief that, um, you know, that the current science is correct. So, it's one of those pieces, it's a bit like the Emperor's New Clothes, and yet, according to current science, those dark matter particles are definitely present. So, in that sense, there's kind of as much proof as we could hope for. What's the value of the piece? Um, you'll have to ask my gallery. <laughs> Can't remember, I'm afraid. Okay, this is um, the first of a, a series of photographs that I made without a camera, so they're cameraless photographs made in the dark room. It's a series of photographs called the Redshift series, and I made them by using meteorite slices. Um, so you can get very, very thin, like three millimeter thick slices of meteorites. I happen to get them on eBay, but you. Uh, I had them authenticated by the Natural History Museum. And they're slices of palisite meteorite, which are very special because they contain crystals. And they're translucent crystals. They look like colored glass. They're incredibly beautiful. And if you put them in a, an enlarger in the dark room and shine the enlarger's light through, as if they were like photographic negatives, then you get an image. So I use color paper to capture the images and print them and then made really large prints of these. So they're abstract images, and yet they offer us a, a window into the formation of the meteorites, the very moment that they were formed, right at the birth of the solar system. So this is long before the formation of the Earth. And what I was interested in in this project was, in part, the idea of time in photography, you know, that there's an exposure time the moment that the photograph is created. And in many senses, photography is deeply rooted in this notion of time and the exposure of light. And it's also rooted in the notion of the index. Um, so this, this pushes the indexicality of the photograph at, into you know, the moment of its kind of making of its photographicness um, right out into the birth of the solar system. Here's another image from the series. So in some senses, these pictures offer a window into another world. You know, they're a kind of huge magnification of a tiny part of one meteorite. But at the same time, it's like you're looking into deep space. And they're kind of cosmic landscapes, and they're almost psychedelic in many senses. And yet they're also kind of scientific, like scientific imaging under a microscope. Um, they look to me somewhat bacterial, or this one looks kind of fleshy. Um, they're somehow forensic, and somehow maybe biological. So I was interested in the kind of epicness of these uh, images. Uh, maybe their kind of romantic quality. Um, and yet you don't know whether you're looking at a micro or a macro scale. Now. Because it's colour photography and I, you know, the photographer or the, the printer has an incredible control over what colours the enlarger actually produces. So the colours that you see here were com completely my um, choice. And I decided to go for this red and blue kind of bias because um, cosmic light has a blue and a red bias, which are called blue and red shift. Um, the blue shift indicates a far-off galaxy which is moving towards the observer, whereas the red shift, which is the title of the series, um, can be observed when distant light sources, such as stars, move away from the Earth um, as a result of the expansion of the universe. Now, to complicate things further, I wanted to bring law into this project. So I looked at copyright law and thought, how can, I, how can I bring copyright law into this? You know, copyright is so much about trying to pin down the identity, the nature of an image, and also the kind of nature of the uh, authorship of an image. So I worked with um, a very interesting intellectual property lawyer called Robert Lands from Finest uh, Stevens Innocent, who's worked with me on a number of legal projects in the past. 
And together we came up with a concept that would propose a new type of copyright uh, or a new kind of uh, slant onto copyrights. So it's a kind of proposition in copyright and each of the images in the series has the same title which is a statement about the copyright of the image. So I'm going to read you this uh, title. C-type print from the Redshift series exposed from a slice of palisite meteorite formed approximately 4.6 million years ago at the birth of the solar system. The artist hereby declares that with effect from 1st of January 2110, copyright protection in this work shall be abandoned on a country by country basis. This global abandonment of copyright is to begin with the prime meridian and will proceed westerly across the globe at the rate of 1,000 miles per year as measured from the equator. So, whilst conventional copyright lasts um, for artists and their heirs 70 years after the artist's death, um, these works will enter the public domain much earlier, depending on when I die, but it will always be much earlier um, than they would normally. So it's a gift from me to put these um, images into the public domain for anyone to use. And the way that the copyright works is it is going to kind of dis it's going to spread across the earth region by region and so like a comet moves across the earth the, the copyright will be placed into the public domain in a kind of arc until the whole world is covered so there's a kind of formal shape creating a formal shape in copyright law here's some more images from the series So this, this is a piece called uh, Terminal Velocity. So it consists of the text on the wall and a spotlight. And this text, 1,404,000 miles per hour, is the speed of the gallery space in space relative to the Big Bang. And this was worked out again with um, Dr. Malcolm Fairburn, who's here tonight. And you might think, well, if the gallery is travelling at that speed, then we're all travelling at that speed. And that's true, we are. But I wanted to create a kind of boundary around it and make it specific to the gallery as a kind of joke about the avant-garde, the artistic avant-garde, and the idea of, um, or maybe even about commercial galleries um, being first to make important artistic statements. Now you'll see that very bold statement on the wall, but at the same time the way it's lit shows up the cracks, the fissures, all the kind of architectural um, marks, kind of weakness really in that wall. So the gallery were actually really embarrassed when I highlighted the wall. They were like, oh my god, you can't let, you can't let people see that. That's just, it's very embarrassing for galleries to be shown to have non-pristine wall space. So in a way, it kind of ironizes the supposed glorification of the gallery. Now, this is a piece called Origin of the Seven Stars. And this is a combination of two different texts. So you see a text in black and a text in gray. The text in black is a Native American myth from the Wyandotte tribe in North America. And it's a story um, which I will read out, or you'll, you'll be able to see it um, in a moment. Now, in grey, um, there's a text from, uh, it's a National Security Presidential Directive from 2004. So it's from George Bush. And they're interspersed in between each other. Here's a close-up. I'm just going to read you um, the first couple of lines of each text, and then I'm going to let you read it yourselves. Um, so the, the text in black, first of all, says, Seven young boys were playing and dancing together in the shade of a tree. After a while, they became hungry. And then the text in grey that's below that says, the fundamental goal of this policy is to advance US scientific, security, and economic interests through a robust space exploration program. So the texts start to kind of 
comment on, on each other in a subtle way through the design of this piece. So they tell, they, they continue on in their original story, but at the same time, they seem somehow to be relevant to each other. When you think about colonialism, and you think about the advance of US economic interests, and the privatization of the commons. So you can see here that the story develops, the little boys, um, well, you should read it. So it's a very political piece. Um, you know, the US um, proclaims that its space, um, space exploration activities are for the common good, and yet, hidden in this, um, in this presidential directive, a quite clear um, statement that, that actually there's kind of an attempt at gaining economic um, advantage and political power through their space exploration program. Maybe we shouldn't be surprised, but one can also see coded within that the kind of opening door towards the privatization of outer space by whoever can get there first. So this is the last piece I'm going to talk about this evening. Um, this is a piece called Contracting Universe. And it consists of the large photographic mural you see on the wall and also the bench that's in front of it. Now, this looks very much like a photograph on the wall, but it isn't. It's actually a found image from NASA and it's actually generated from data. So it's completely not photographic. This is a virtual image of, it's a digital rendering of the surface of Mars. And when I first saw it, I thought, my God, that's the most beautiful photograph I've ever seen in my life. You know, it looks like an Ansel Adams or something, you know, classic, modernist, 20th century photography, of perhaps from the F64 group. And it's completely awe-inspiring and kind of wow image. And yet, what I found interesting about this image is actually when you go into the detail, it starts to break down. So, this is the image closer. When you actually get really close up, you start to see the pixels. And you see the kind of jaggy edges. And actually you realise that can't be a night sky because it just doesn't look realistic. So, what looked, photograph what looked photographic starts to fall apart. So even though you're physically getting closer to the image to look at it like this, it seems to be getting further away from you. And somehow I thought that was a nice comment on our attempt to understand space through exploration. You know, the closer we get, the more leading edge technology we use to understand it, the more we realize we don't understand, or the more incredible it gets. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Um, thank you, Carrie. Um, any questions in the audience? The because um, it wasn't clear from the picture, the um, the, the meteorite uh, pictures. How are they presented on light boxes? They kind of look like no. they're rare and no, they're um, they're photographs. I'll go back to the uh, they're, they're C type photographs. So they're just color large, really large color photographs. And I lit them with those kind of spotlights that you can direct, so they're a very tight shape. So they're kind of rectangular shape. And painted the walls grey, so they have that kind of museum-y 
how science needs to feel. So they look kind of very much like they're glowing. The um, the stuff from Star City. You said you were the first uh, Western artist to, to get in there to make it. Obviously, quite a few people have gone in since then. <clears throat> Looking at that work uh, now, um, because the more recent stuff, uh, especially this work, it's got a, it's a sense of coming out of very pristine. Um, yeah, this is the media now. It's it's so pristine. Also, like the dark matter. This is immediately escapes an attempt to capture it, and also the last image is not really there. It's so new and so uh, novel in the way it's produced. Um, the other earlier work always struck me as having a sense that this was a, a past, a sort of silence, so a, a, a vision of the future. Like, like this microphone had already gone away. Um, what do you, uh, I suppose, with the passage of time, how do you feel about your take on the, the technology of the future of the Soviet space program now? Because that's become all completely privatised. It's, it's more privatised than the US program in yeah, some way. Or what China is doing, I suppose, because they're taking the moon by storm. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it was a really amazing trip to Russia I had in 98. It was such a pivotal moment. I mean, the economy was collapsing, and some of the technology that I, I found there um, was being sold off. Um, there's this incredible place called Vedenka, which is a kind of, um, used to be a theme parky display for the glories of the Soviet Empire, and it was a place where... Russians, before the fall of the Soviet bloc, um, Russians could go and discover about, you know, farming or, you know, um, mining or all the kind of industries um, that, that Russia was involved in, especially the things that Russia excelled at. And after, uh, after Perestroika and Glasnost, this was turned into uh, just huge exhibition halls devoted to selling white goods, consumer goods. So, you know, loads of fridges and all sorts, and it was just so much space. And in what, in the space hall, there were the whole collection, I mean, really super valuable, and they were just roped off in a corner, and you're thinking, oh my God, you know, some mafia, you could just steal it, literally, you could have stolen it overnight, no problem. And I'm sure some of that collection did go into private hands via criminal means. Um, but it's very poignant, really, because you felt that no one valued this, material in the way that it, it should have been valued, apart from in the museums, apart from in the universities, but in public space where you often did find, um, you know, in a, a theme park in, in Moscow, for example, there was um, a shuttle, you know, the original Buran shuttle, um, and it was just turned into a, a kid's attraction. So there was a kind of poignancy um, and a, a feeling that no one valued the or there wasn't, you know, it was, a, it was a luxury at that point to value that sort of technological prowess. Um, so I felt that it was a pivotal moment. And looking back on it now, you can see that Russia has gone more down that line now. So I don't, I don't know what's happened to that material since then. Right, Rob. Yeah, I just have some just a point of interest to add now um, in the sort of form of uh, diplomatic uh, warming up of relations uh, this week um, the uh, last Soviet citizen Sergei Krikalyov is visiting the UK and he's actually going to be giving a talk at the BFI on Saturday I think there's still tickets available for that and they're also unveiling the statue to Yuri Gagarin tomorrow outside the British Council in Spring Gardens just that prefer nothing but just if people want to know, there is a kind of, because this year is Gagarin anniversary year, there's a bit of a revival going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, do you have any opinion about that? Um, no. <laughs> um, no. But, but to go back to Piers's point, um, which I think had lots of layers in that question, um, kind of part of your question was about the sort of physicality and the materiality of, you know, the, the images that I've taken and, and the kind of messy stuff of technology, the messy stuff of, of space travel. And I think 
A lot of my work since then has been quite experiential. It's been about the gallery space, um, and it's been about making visitors, viewers, very conscious of their sight sightedness in a gallery and their sightedness in front of a, a work of art and their kind of involvement in that work of art. And I think that that connects that early space work with these much, as you rightly point out, much cleaner, aesthetically, formally cleaner, you know, very precise works um, that you see in this later show. So for me, there is, although I haven't shown this early space work, um, I haven't shown it very much recently, um, it's still, I think, part of a, the same practice. <laughs> hasn't changed so hugely. Is there a link um, with those early space photographs and the analog processes used in the photographs? In that this is a, a dying, nostalgic I don't think photography is dying and nostalgic. And I also don't think analog photography is dying and nostalgic. If you go to art colleges, um, the photography departments are stuffed full of students using analog media. And most professional artists that's working that's in photography... As a scientific instrument. Oh, as a scientific instrument. You mean analog... I'd in, in art schools, it becomes kind of romanticised. No, I, I don't think it is actually. I don't think I, I see what you, I see where you're coming from, and I, I know what you're saying. But at the same time, I think just from a practical perspective, at the moment, the kind of killer app of digital photography is a blend between analog and digital, where you shoot on analog, you know, you shoot on film, scan it, and work digitally on the scan. And until digital photography improves substantially, you will not be able to better the results of, of that kind of mode of capture. So, you know, if we're going to get sort of technical, then I think... I don't think it's nostalgic. And I think that, um, you know, the images... You know, I tried, I tried producing them with a microscope and a, and a scanner, and they were really just dead. They looked like scientific illust illustrations in a meteorite textbook. What's beautiful in the dark room is you get this spread of light that kind of seeps out through the crystals and you get a kind of glow that you would never get through a scanner. So I, th I guess it's just about a sort of specificness for a particular medium, using it in a particular way. And I, I personally don't see it as nostalgic, although I think it's interesting that you do, and maybe that's, that adds another layer into possible interpretation. Can I ask a question? Can I need the microphone? You do. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. I've got uh, one comment and one question. Um, it's interesting if you read Deleuze's uh, book, Francis Bacon, The Logic of Sensation, and he talks about the painter um, through his particular. Um, use of the paint and moulding paint out of sensation, you enter into a relationship with the forces of the cosmos. And you kind of think, well, that's nonsense. And then when you talk in your work about being able to look through at these meteors and have an experience of the birth of the cosmos, you don't think it's nonsense, which I think is very interesting. But my question is, um, what, do you uh, think there are parallels or some sort of comment that you make about the relationship between the colonization of outer space and the colonization of the Americas and uh, colonialization through capitalism? Sorry, the question is, what, what's the comment? Do you make the links between the two? I mean, yeah, that, that work, um, Origin of the Seven Stars, that, that is trying to make that link between cap not, not all capitalism, I guess sort of neoliberal capitalism, which assumes there is nothing, there should be nothing except the marketplace. Everything should take place in a market context. And um, the colonization of uh, America, particularly, um, by Europeans. So yes, it does try to set out those, make a link. 
and let that link just run in a kind of open way. So yeah, um, it needs to be said. And I think, you know, what, what's one thing I discovered um, in my research for this project was that there's a, quite an interesting writer on space law who thinks that NASA is communist because NASA is devoted to placing this knowledge and scientific knowledge into the public domain and that that necessarily is a form of, of communism and that current UN law which is about protecting space as a commons for the benefit of mon mankind that is a, a communist ideology you know, he's a very right-wing writer. Um, but I thought that was really, really interesting. One more. Just a, a quick comment on what you said. In the early days of NASA, there were um, writings by someone called Frederick Jackson Turner, who was a 19th century writer who was um, uh, basically saying that America was bound to uh, diminish because its frontiers had been met and needed to look for new frontiers. And um, his writings in summary form were distributed throughout NASA in its very early days. Um, just in a, a quick story you might be interested in, in, in legacy technology. I was in Baikonur some years ago and happened to recognize something as the fuselage of an N1 rocket. And the N1 was what the Russians were building to um, top the Saturn V, it was what they were going to send people to the moon on. And it was hard to recognize because the fuselage had been cut in half, placed on its opened end side by side, and were used as storage sheds, with no plaques, no signs or anything. The um, original plan for my project, and I'm glad I was talked out of this because I think it would have been very dangerous, but I was, I was actually planning to go to Kazakhstan and look at um, not only with the abandoned fuselages used in the way you're saying, but also I, I heard that they were used by nomadic tribes as forms of shelter. So, you know, it would have been a fantastic series of photographs, I think, but it seemed too dangerous at the time for a single woman to go there. Anyways, for the future, for somebody else, maybe. Uh, one more. I can speak louder, it's okay. okay. Uh, I, I, I perceive a lot of humor and um, uh, poetry and some sort of irony in your work. Um, this is my perception and my view uh, on it, and I really like it. I was just wondering what is actually your approach and what's been the reaction of, of the public uh, in that gallery. How it, it, has it been seen like something that you can can have a little laugh and, and smile and take it lightly or, or is it something that you wanted to, to keep in a kind of a quite serious sphere of work? Um, well, it's a good question. Um, my work's really quite playful and I think, you know, there's kind of po-facedness of the way it looks when you first look at it. It looks very serious. But actually it's often really full of kind of humour and, and people kind of ending up sending themselves up, um, like the, the UN conversation, I just think has this very subtle humour. Um, so, or the, I think the, the dark matter piece also has kind of got a joke embedded in it. Uh, I just, yeah, it's there, it's there if people want to see it. I think generally it's been received in that way. Um, it hasn't, you know, it's, not, it's only recent, it's, it was shown first in October of last year, so it's only really um, kind of, it got a few reviews then, and it's kind of, the works are now being shown elsewhere, so they're kind of gathering more critical writing as time passes. Um, so, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I guess the meteorite piece is not so, you know, humour-oriented. So, you know, there's just different interpretations, but... It's been, is it, you, we can always tell how people interpret the work by what kind of shows curators try and put the work in after. So, you know, it, it's kind of going into shows about space exploration, um, shows about um, space, kind of ideas of the void, um, shows about concept, recent conceptual work. 
Uh, thank you, Kerry.